You're listening to an Anderson Entertainment production. This episode, it's a fab fact bonanza. We're racing to meet a deadline in the randomizer. I'm worried about the fab fact bonanza, but we're also joined by writer and critic Kim Newman. It's all coming up in pod 230 of the slightly worrisome Jerry Anderson podcast. Let's get started. Let's go. Spectrum is green. The Jerry Anderson Podcast with Jamie Anderson and Richard James. Hello, well, Richard James. Hello, Jamie Anderson. How are you? Uh, I'm very well, thank you very much. Oh, good. Thank yes, you. well, I, I'm. I'm very pleased to be here with you once again to talk uh, about all things Jerry Anderson. With feeling. So, no, <laughs> sorry. I would just say, Podstroms. It's quite late at night when Richard and I are recording yeah, because he's got a true. job and he's a very busy boy. So <laughs> yeah. we're doing these late night recordings. So if if I mean, Richard isn't an actor, an Olivier nominated actor, so he uh. can cover for his exhaustion. Oh. I'm I'm less able, so apologies. Okay. But no, yeah. I am very very pleased. Um, yeah. Uh, and you know what? I was thinking earlier on before we uh, got on this record. Yeah. Wonder why you look pale. Yeah. <laughs> it's very hard work. All this thinking. Yeah. So we keep coming back every week, and we have done for the past 229 <sighs> weeks in a row, we have. which is quite astonishing, really. Yeah. And all of this is obviously buoyed by our lovely podsterons and Mm -hmm. even those who don't listen to the podcast because they're still getting involved in the world of anderson and you know they keep wanting more and keep asking for stuff and keep enthusing about it and they keep us all kind of afloat and enthusiastic when things when things are pretty tough but i was thinking today isn't it amazing that we've got such a wonderful team of people constantly Mm. churning out wonderful stuff from yes. articles and videos on YouTube to audio dramas and motion comics and books galore and episodes yeah, yeah. of the podcast and all those yeah, things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's just lovely and very heartening and heartwarming yeah. and makes me smile even when we're extremely tired. So mm. thanks, Podstrons, but special thanks to Team AE and all those doing stuff with us. Yeah. It's very cool. Yeah, it's great. Nice. Anyway, I don't normally gush at the start of a no, podcast. No, you don't. Uh, I've we, never seen you gush quite so much. Well, it will hurt me. You, haven't, you, you can't see what I'm doing. Uh, <laughs> no, but I it's, can imagine. It's, it's normally more gubbins than uh, gush at the, the Jerry gushing, Anderson podcast. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, but uh, two of the gubbinators, well, I'm one of them, I suppose, is three. But the other gubbinators are uh, him there, Richard James. Yes, that's me. Uh, and later, uh, an additional gubbinator, best known as the Randomizer. Perhaps we should call him Ram- Randomizer Gubbinator. No, that's uh, uh, okay. also. A bit weird now, Chris yes. Dale. Uh, yes, you are tired, aren't you? I am tired. I can tell because <laughs> you're not making any sense at all. Oh, really? Oh dear. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll tell you what. I'll hand yeah. over to you to make some sense of what's going up in this podcast while I have a little drink. Oh, right. Well, yeah, you do that. You sort yourself out. Well, we've got all the usual <laughs> stuff coming up. Gubbins is the word. Uh, yes, we've got the randomizer a little later on. Uh, we might even have a bit of Jerry Anderson newsy news news news. We will, and uh, we might even have a fab fact in a moment that or two. Too. Uh, we might also have the first part of an interview with Kim Newman, <laughs> conducted by our very own Ben Page. Yes. Uh, but mm-hmm. most importantly, yes. the podsterons themselves, ah. our lovely, lovely listeners, have, of course, been getting in touch. Mm. They've been emailing us at podcast at jerryanderson.com. Mm. Uh, they've been tweeting us and hashtagging us Jerry Anderson Podcast, tagging me, Richard N. James, him over there, I'm Jamie Anderson, and him over there waiting by the big red button, uh, Chris Dalek. They've also been commenting on our YouTube channel as well, which is full of really interesting stuff. And I challenge you to go to the YouTube channel and uh, I challenge you to watch just one thing because I tell you now, that's impossible. Because you'll watch one and you'll watch another and another. And before you know it, the whole weekend's gone. That is true. I mean, there's yeah. over 100 fab facts on our YouTube channel. I mean, that, wow. that's that, reason really? enough to go, yes. Oh, that's, I know. that's a few people's idea of hell, that is. Uh, but many's idea of heaven. They, right. they often are our, our best performers. Uh, uh, oh, sure. Occasionally. Yeah. I don't uh, know, yeah, I don't know why, because it's just no. you and I talking nonsense and me oh, well. stumbling through a fab fact. But there we go. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, that's <sighs> great. So there we are. So that's pod two, three. Oh, coming to your ears right now. 
Oh, okay, right. Well, um, I've had a lovely glug of grapefruit squash <laughs> while you've been Ooh. doing that. I'm not sure I like the sound of that. <laughs> it's yeah, you see, it's yeah. surprisingly delicious. Actually, okay, okay, highly, highly recommended. If is it you, the pink uh, grapefruit? Of course, squash. it is. Oh, yes, I know. Yeah, nice. yeah. See. Anyway, uh, now I've had that, I'm feeling all energised and ready. Oh, good. To deliver you. Yes. A fantabulous. Yes. Fantastical. Yes. Fab fact. Oh. <sighs> now, time for this week's fab facts. Right. So yes. Fab facts. Hoping oh, yeah. that I can do this because I do have slightly sticky fingers from the grapefruit juice now. Oh, sticky fingers and clammy ears. Oh, <laughs> oh lethal combination. Absolutely. Uh, I have a book of fab facts. That was it. Uh, oh, yeah. And I'm going to flick through it properly momentarily. Rich is going to shout fab at a random point, And that yeah. random point will stop me at a random location within the book. And then I will read you something from that page in that book of fab facts. Are you ready with your fab, Richard James? Born ready. Here comes the flicking. Fab! Oh, that was a really was um, yes. core. Mm, I know. Gave me a bit of an Sharp adrenaline the point. spike, but that's what Absolutely. I needed. Uh, okay, well, this is a nice one. Okay, th- right. Okay, good. That's I, a change. I, I think you're going to be quite pleased with yourself. All right. Uh, Richard James, have you ever heard of Lawn Green? Yes, I have heard of Lawn Green. Well, that's, well, that's useful. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, he was famously in Bonanza, I think, uh, a, a, a Western series. Mm-hmm. Uh, Battlestar Galactica played Adama, I think, or Adama, was it? Yeah, anyway, on, uh, on Battlestar Galactica. Yes, famous actor. Know him well. Very good. Well, yes. So to sci-fi fans, they are going to know him from Battlestar Galactica, as yeah. you say. Mm-hmm. Uh, but as you've also mentioned, the Canadian star was most famous for appearing in the Western TV series Bonanza. Yeah. Now, Bonanza is fabled to have had quite the influence on Thunderbirds. Um, oh. In Bonanza itself, Lawn Green played a widowed father oh. of three adult sons. Do you see where we're going with this? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and it's a format that reportedly rather appealed to Dad and Sylvia. Furthermore, Jeff Tracy was actually sculpted to resemble Lawn's chiselled features. Oh, yes, I can allegedly. see that now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But... Did you know, right. this being a fab fact, you can probably guess, yeah. that there's actually an even more obscure connection between Thunderbirds and Lawn Green? Go on. Well, <laughs> I will. <laughs> uh, before television started, Lawn was famous in Canada as a radio announcer on the CBC. During the early years of World War II, he was even known as the Voice of Doom, since he had the unenviable oh, task of reading out casualty reports on the air. Oh, oh gosh, gosh, what a terrible mm. thing to have to do. Yeah. Anyway, after serving in the Royal Canadian Air Force, he went to Toronto and founded a school for radio announcers, would you believe? Well, well. Uh, now, there's a 1950 newspaper ad which announces evening classes for speech, acting, and radio writing. Good idea. Now, sadly, uh, you say that, but uh, the yeah. Academy folded by 1953. Oh. Oh, uh, but that's actually, I think, because Lorne headed to America for higher paying jobs. Hmm. Um, several up and coming Canadian talents had studied there, including uh, actor comedian Leslie Nielsen, oh, yeah. Star Trek star James Doohan. Oh, yeah. And uh, some guy called Shane Rimmer. No! Who would later play. Scott oh, Tracy in Thunderbirds. Lovely. So it turns out there's just a bonanza of connections between nice. Lawn Green and Thunderbirds. <laughs> oh, that's clever. Yeah. yeah that's good. I didn't yeah, know so that. And I've got the ad here. Mm-hmm. Uh, careers for trained personnel. Lawn Green's Academy of Radio Arts. Lovely. Offering adult evening classes in speech for radio, stage, television and public speaking. Acting. Radio Laboratory, it says. Ooh. Radio Writing, Dramatic, Commercial and Educational. Radio Announcing, News, Narration, Sports, Disc Jockey, etc. Wow, He also Amazing. offered Junior Saturday classes, would you believe? Sweet. So there you go. That was uh, held at 447 Jarvis Street in Toronto. <laughs> I know it well. Yeah. Still there, <laughs> I think. Yeah. Would, I wonder what it is now. It's a uh, burger joint now. If we, <laughs> we, well, now we have got some... Torontonians. That's probably yeah. not the correct phrase, but I'm saying it. <laughs> uh, if you can tell us what is at 447 Jarvis Street, if that even yeah, is still a street, great. that'd be great. I don't want to go onto Google Maps and spoil it that yeah. way. I'd, lo- I'd love some interaction. So. First-hand knowledge, yes. Exactly. exactly. So t- so those who live in Toronto or Torontonians, as you now are, um, please <laughs> let like us know. Email us podcast at jerryanderson.com.
Oh, that's great. I think that's a great story because it it speaks of a time, doesn't it? When radio was was king. Absolutely. Even though, even though they had movies and TV was, was you know, well and truly on its way. Yeah. But radio was still king. That's nice. Yeah. But it, it's, it doesn't matter where they seem to come from, whether it was Canada, the US, mm. uh, the UK with the BBC rep. Mm. So many of them trained and cut their teeth in radio. Yeah. yeah. And it seems to just have benefited so many people it gives you a different approach i guess because you've got to do so much work with the voice which then is a natural fit for doing so much work with the voice and you're voicing a public character absolutely right yeah yeah spot on i mean we see that today don't we with the likes of big finish and so on and absolutely uh, you know the anderson entertainment adaptations of various uh, jerry anderson series that voice acting is still just as valuable the 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 ability to you know uh, inhabit other parts several parts sometimes within the same story just using your voice is still a, a very valuable craft it is indeed and we're lucky to have one of those types co-hosting this very podcast Oh, oh Richard yeah. James. Is he coming later? Who's that? <laughs> is that Chris? Yeah, know, Chris has done a bit. Chris does as well, but we know yeah. we, we, we all know very well it's you. Anyway, uh, I I rather liked that uh, yeah. lawn green fact. So uh, yes, there we go. I think that brings us extremely clunkily this week to the end of this week's lawn, lawn fact, fact. Oh, which I suppose could be confused, couldn't it, with some sort of gardening podcast? <laughs> well, let's, this week's let's... lawn fact. <laughs> Hey, you, I'll yeah. give you a quick lawn fact as a, a, an extra one. Okay, Go on. you ready yes. for this? Yes. So, Dad was quite fond of uh, tending to his garden Fair uh, as a sort of means of relaxation, although he never really relaxed because he was always a bit on edge, I think. Right. Um, and he used to mow the lawn with a you know semi-motorised push-along one, but yeah. in, in later life he treated himself to a ride-on mower. Uh, red, um, I think it might have been a Yamaha or something like that. Yeah, nice. uh, it was very fancy and mounted on the front of his lawn mowing tractor was yes. the number plate Fab One. Of course it was. <laughs> and ah. that is the end of this week's <laughs> number lawn plate fact. fact. What? Oh, I see. I'm oh, sorry. Oh. oh, no. Oh, I'm that was sorry. our best opportunity I ever know, to I have blew an in-podcast gag and you yeah, ruined it. Right, so let's sorry. move along. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, despite everything you've just heard, it yes. might be a good idea, dear Podstron, if you're enjoying the Jerry Anderson podcast, to subscribe to us on whichever platform you're listening to us on. And why not leave us a nice rating? A review and a rating five stars would be great and a few words telling the world what you think of it. Maybe ignore the last five minutes or so. But apart, you know, apart from that, tell everyone that you're really enjoying the podcast. Uh, now I'm going to oh, head straight dear. on over to our email bag. Yes, redeem uh, which, yourself, Richard yes, James. Which, as ever, is a, is a bulging bag of goodness. Uh, this is from Tom Poynton, who says, "Hello there." Hello. Uh, I discovered your wonderful podcast a few weeks ago Ooh. when Frank Skinner mentioned it on his radio show. Did he? Apparently so. Oh, well, that's, that's nice. Good, Why did he yeah. mention us? Well, I don't know. We know that he's something of a fan. So yeah, but it doesn't maybe... say whether the mention was in glowing terms or not, yeah, does it? True. That's so whatever true. you do, don't listen to the Jerry Hansen <laughs> yeah. podcast. I've just listened to the Halloween special and their puns were appalling. Oh, that's fair. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> sorry about that. Uh, just listening to Pod 228, says Tom, and an email reminded me of my top Anderson scene. Ah, oh, yes, we've spoken about this over the past few weeks. We have. Um, it has to be the crash landing of Thunderbird 2 and the deployment of uh, the firefighting equipment, yes. says Tom. I remember watching that as a kid and trying to work out how I could do that to my plastic toy Thunderbird 2 without it getting ruined. Mm. Uh, I also have very fond memories as a child of building a Kinex tower that held up a cardboard Empire State building which was made from several separating sections and having it fall to the ground despite the best efforts of my little toy Thunderbirds. It must have been at least five feet tall which for a child of seven was absolutely huge. Keep up the excellent podcast. Kind regards from Tom Poynton. Oh, well. Uh, Thank you, Tom. I, I think it's many, nice, many people have potentially destroyed their toys trying to mimic yeah. that uh, Terror yeah. New York City scene. Absolutely. Because uh, it is a That's lovely right. one. But also, how wonderful that people are finding us through Frank yeah. Skinner of all I people. I know. I know. Isn't that great? Well, yeah, Mr. Nice. Skinner, if you're listening, we'd love to have you as a podcast guest. Uh, we certainly so would. Do email well. us podcast at jerryanderson.com. <laughs> yeah, if you're Frank Skinner, yeah. yeah. Uh, Miles Parrish, who's been with us a while now, says, Ahoy, gentlemen. Ahoy, At the hoy. recommendation of another podsteron, I recently read the 1966 novelisation of Thunderbirds Are Go by Angus P. Allen. Ah. Uh, it took me about as long to read the whole book as it takes the Zero X to be assembled in the film <laughs> and yet contains so much extra material 
material that was obviously left on the cutting room floor when the film was edited. Yes. More's the pity, says Miles. Are there any plans to get this one republished? He says, I think it's added a lot to my enjoyment of the film and would love it to be available to a wider audience once more. All the best from Down Under. And that's from Miles. Uh, yes, Miles, it's definitely on our list. Yeah. Um, but, you know, as I sort of said at the top of the podcast, really, everybody's working really, really hard to churn out as much wonderful stuff as they can. Mm. But we're still somewhat bandwidth limited. Yeah. But we will keep putting out as much as we can. And uh, it's on the list for stuff for hopefully not a distant future. How's that? Great. Best well, I can do. Please, Miles. That's lovely, yeah. Uh, dog, Doug Morris, not Dog Morris, which I almost said there, but <laughs> Doug Morris, who may have a dog, I don't know, said, uh, but those potters who have received or are about to receive the Stand By For Action concert CD, mm. wow, are you in for a treat, ah. says Doug. Uh, I've just experienced it on headphones with the volume turned up quite high. It's fantastic. Ooh. All our favourite tunes are there, from Twizzle to New Captain Scarlet. I dare you, says Doug, not to tap your feet to Captain Scarlet hijacked Joe 90 at UFO all the tracks are top notch a fantastic souvenir of a great concert and for those of us podders who are actually there a treasured memory of a wonderful weekend in Birmingham Aww. enjoy regards from Doug Morris yeah quite right too Thanks, something Doug, special is lovely that? yeah I, it's I think I've said before it's been very emotional listening back to it and watching it back particularly because I was I can't remember much of the event itself <laughs> yeah, from rushing sure. around that's but, right uh, wow. yeah just just hearing the the tone of the audience because you know live things you you hear the audience applauding or cheering yes. or laughing or yes. whatever but there's there was something extra special about yeah. the the enthusiasm the energy of that audience i think so if you were there yeah. thanks for being part of that and if you weren't don't worry you get to experience it and uh, i'll be mentioning the dvd and blu-ray shortly in the news oh. Great, good, good. Uh, I mean, you mentioned the uh, energy and enthusiasm of the audience, but of mm. course we must also pay tribute to the energy and enthusiasm of the orchestra. Oh, I know. Because those tunes really <laughs> bounce along, don't they? They rock. They rock along. It's um, fantastic. There was not a lot of rest time for them. And no. they, you know, changing styles and speeds. Yep. And uh, it was just, yeah, a, an amazing tour de force. Yeah, absolutely right. Uh, right. This last one is from James, who says, Hello, Andersonists and all fellow Podsterons. <laughs> uh, when, yeah, when re-watching Toy Story 2 recently, after learning about the pre-century 21 days of all things Anderson listening to this podcast, I realised the plot could be a nod to the Andersonverse. Toy Story 2, really? Well, James says, We learn in the film that Woody is a toy version of the main character from a marionette TV show called Woody's Roundup. According to the character of the prospector, Woody's Roundup was cancelled due to children's interests changing from westerns to sci-fi in the mm. 1960s, and consequently space toys like Buzz Lightyear becoming popular is the reason the show's toy line was forgotten. Do you think, says James, that this could be a wink to the fact that Supercar, Fireball XL5 and other sci-fi shows came after Four Feather Falls, or that this was part of an overall cultural shift at the time. Interesting, isn't it? I mean, we'll never know for sure unless yeah. unless somebody uh, involved in the production of that uh, franchise yeah. <laughs> is going to let yeah. us know otherwise. I yeah. think it's certainly possible. I mean, you think of the people, the sort of age of people involved, certainly Tom Hanks obviously voiced Woody was uh, yep. is, is a huge Fireball XL5 fan we can imagine that might extend back to Supercar yeah uh, and people yeah. of his uh, his generation who would have been involved in creating Toy Story who also might have been exposed to the same sort of stuff so mm. I mean I'll, I'll lean on saying a strong maybe yeah, strong maybe. I think that's good. I think it's uh, mm. it's it's almost possible to see anything through a sort of an Anderson lens, isn't it? And yeah. uh, you know, I suppose you know at least part of the time, it's probably true. Well, it makes sense because it's just such a huge cultural impact across yeah. generations, across the the English speaking yeah. world and beyond. Actually, of course. That's right. So yes, maybe an even stronger maybe. Yeah, I think so. Uh, all for now, but uh, do keep those emails coming into podcast at jerryanderson.com because I'd love to read them out next time. <laughs> all right, calm I down. Would. Calm oh, down, dear. I'd like nothing better. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I look forward to you reading things. Yeah. This time and next time, in fact. Sure. Yeah, good. Uh, would you like a little break and uh, I can take over and do some Jerry Anderson news? Oh, I love a bit of news. Yeah, let's go for it. That's a relief. Here it is.
It's uh, the Jerry Anderson news and news, 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 news. Oh, you went all 1940s on me I there. Did. That was it's nice. Just thought I tried to be different. Okay, well, the sort of the sounds of retro is quite fitting for my first news item today. Oh, good. As many of you all seen or have uh, heard, possibly Posterons, uh, Thunderbirds Fire and Fury is available uh-huh. for pre order. It's our latest full cast audio drama taken from the pages of TV Century 21. Uh, would you like a little trailer to he- hear a taster? What, now? Yeah, right now. Oh, yes, please. Okay, pressing the button. Anderson Entertainment presents Thunderbirds, Fire and Fury. Blazing danger. The blaze is out of control. I'm armed and dangerous when on a mission. We're ready for anything, Mr. Tracy. Oh! Oh! Give it up. You don't stand a chance. Virgil, what's happening? Is everything all right? Thunderbird Ford, come in. Do you read me? Gordon! The Space Mirror. Someone, anyone, payday! FAP, Thunderbird 1 setting course for Lake Geneva. Drop your gun and come out. (laughs) The shield is holding. I don't know for how much longer. John, John, do you read me? Alan, we've lost contact with Thunderbird 5. Oh, well, that's pretty dramatic, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. Wow. Yes, I think they've really settled in beautifully, that voice cast. They're very smart, and yeah. um, it just is all sounding rather marvellous. I'm very very proud of the team who've uh, put that together. Uh, now, this will be out hopefully later in the month, or CD and download. CD available from shop.jerryanderson.com. Download available from bigfinish.com. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, you can see a video version of that trailer on the YouTube channel, which looks rather lovely. And uh, yes, I just, you know, I would just implore you to give Thunderbirds audio dramas a go because yeah. they're really fun and your mind does the most fantastic job of filling in the missing visuals. Um, it really does. Yeah, yes, you're right. In, in the it's best funny, way possible. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. There you go. Now, uh, we've also mentioned, uh, aside from that, that we will be going to the London Comic Con Winter Edition at Olympia on the 19th and 20th of November. Oh, yes. So we hope to see you there. Now we're going to have some rather special guests along. Uh, Lee Sullivan will be at our booth. Uh, oh, yeah. As will uh, Chris Thompson. Hmm. As will Chris Dale. Ah. As will I. Yes. And as will Richard James. Oh, yeah. Well, why not? Well, we, there's. Why not? We, uh, why is more to the point, I think. Uh, yeah, true, uh, yes. Uh, now, we, we do have something which we've hinted at uh, which we're not going to tell you about quite yet but if you are able to make it to London Comic Con winter then it'll be your first opportunity to get your hands on this new thing right you you playing along like you don't know what it is of course Richard knows what what it is you know what it is anyway so we'd love to see you there we also have free Thunderbirds hats which we'll be uh, handing out for free while stocks last anyone uh, who uh, is on our you know, on our sort of signing panel will be happy to have a chat and do photos and sign things yep. uh, we'll have a retail stall there so if you want to pick up a copy of the Fire Black Cell 5 anthology or Moonbase Alpha mm-hmm. or Thunderbirds vs the Hood or many mm-hmm. other things uh, and get them signed by those involved then uh, that's a great time to do it so hopefully we'll see you at London Comic Con yeah that'll be exciting won't it it will be. Uh, and Lee Sullivan and I are doing a panel on the Sunday, I think at 12.15, in the comics area, about uh, future comic releases, the Fireball XL5 anthology, Century 21, TV Century 21 comics and various other things, and future publications too. So we'd love to see you there. Great. Uh, well, we hope it will be. Yeah. Uh, now, by the time you're listening to this, if you have pre-ordered a Standby for Action concert DVD or Blu-ray, it is my hope that they will either be in your hands in the next 24 hours, may already yeah. be in your hands now. Yeah. If not, they'll be winging their way to you. Okay, um, great. Th- at the time of recording, they are supposed to be delivered to our <clears throat> warehouse tomorrow, uh, which would mean in time for stuff to be on its way to you for the day of release of the podcast nice. on Monday. Nice. Um, but they are pretty much there. Fingers crossed you'll have them very shortly. Thank you again for your patience. Uh, a reminder also of Network's rather lovely releases coming up later in the month. At the end of this month, they will be releasing their edition of the Standby for Action concert. Uh-huh. But anyone who's got it from us will get it first by uh-huh. 
factor of several weeks, we hope. Thank yeah. goodness. Uh, they're also doing an extended edition of Jerry Anderson Life Uncharted and yeah. the super colorization set with six colorized black and white episodes, including Four for the Fools, Two Supercars, and Three Fireballs, oh. um, and some other special programming as well. Now you can either pre order those from networkandair.com or you can hang tight and order from shop.jerryanderson.com from the day of release. Great. So that's exciting. Now, uh, also, have you seen these action figures? Uh, these three, wait. three and three quarter inch action figures of, uh, of Troy Tempest and I have Scott. Not. And uh, oh well, no, I did mention them last week very briefly, but uh, right. they're easy for you to forget, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> I've so, been very busy. I know you have been very busy. So Wave One includes Captain Scarlet and Joe Ninety and Scott and uh, Troy and Ed Straker and John Koenig. Um, uh, with with multiple other waves of action figures planned. Uh, now, we've spoken to Big Chief, as I mentioned last week, and they are extremely confident of sticking to their delivery timeline of April next year. So we're saying April, May to allow for a little bit of wiggle room. Okay. Um, but things are already well underway there. Lots of you have been uh, pre-ordering them, and you can pre-order them from shop.terryanderson.com. And finally, for mm. now, goodness wow. me, this is a busy one, isn't it? Isn't it? It is very busy. Um Ben Page, producer Ben Page, has been working oh, yeah. very hard over at Anderson Insiders. We've moved platform to a new platform called Circle, and it's a very busy, thriving community. So if you don't feel like you're getting enough Anderson from all the stuff we put out there, but you'd like <laughs> the inside track on things, more behind the scenes, discounts on the store, uh, chances to to ask us all sorts of stuff and join in with live videos and yeah. loads of other goodies, then just go to ander.sn slash insiders. That's A-N-D-R dot S-N slash insiders. And you can join there uh, from as little as, I think, £5.99 a month or $6.99 a month. Okay. Um, yeah. And if you don't like Pretty it, then you can disappear after a month and sure. only be ever so slightly lighter in the pocket. But um, yeah. it's yeah. a lovely, lovely community and you get to see stuff in advance all sorts of goodies over there so go and enjoy and that whew, is the Crikey. end of this week's Jerry Anderson News that was the news exhausting news another glug of grapefruit squash there for there me. you go that'll pick you up I mean really it's a pretty good time to be a Jerry Anderson fan isn't it I know we say that quite often but it seems pretty good mm. at the moment I think so I think so yeah. there's, we've got so much cool stuff planned for well really the next few years so mm. there's, there's no end in sight uh, mm. that'll either be music to your ears or, <laughs> or, or very much not <laughs> that's right we all want to cover your ears one of the two yes uh, yeah, good. Uh, now, look, if you're online, you might uh, have heard of Facebook. And if you've heard of Facebook, you might have heard of the official Jerry Anderson Podcast listeners group. And if you've heard of it, you might be a member. You might be one of the, I think, 885 current oh, members of the group. we're approaching your target, aren't we? I don't, are we going to do it by Christmas? New Year? It's getting tight. I don't know. It is getting very tight. Let's have a final push over the next few weeks. But uh, Scott Sadler uh, posted there this week, uh, Halloween 2022 was a fun set up this year. Uh, Virgil Tracy Scarecrow, and he posted a picture of this with lots of mums, dads and trick-or-treaters taking selfies. Uh, it came complete with a speaker inside the hat, which played spooky Barry Gray scores from shows like UFO End Titles, The Mysterons Theme and The Sweets from Lunaville 7 Crazy. To 101 and Shadow of Fear. Amazing. Isn't it? Have you seen a picture of it? I have. It's, it's pretty terrifying. terrifying. <laughs> Virgil Tracy Scarecrow. It's good fun. Yeah. Uh, now, Clint uh, Nickel posted a picture of the Fireball XL5 comic anthology and said, wow, this arrived in Australia today. It is a thing of beauty. Uh, it was worth it getting up at 4am to order, thanks to the team at the Anderson store. Oh, brilliant. I'm glad that's, that's pretty good to get it to Australia. Quick. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Really nice. Amazing. Uh, Rebecca Andrews. Uh, this arrived today, she said, posting a picture of her standby for action CD. Hooray! Uh, just to say a huge thank you to all involved in the concert and to those involved in the production of the home release. Many happy memories of attending this earlier this year. It was FAB to meet some fellow podders and also John Colshaw. Amazing! Yeah, it is nice, isn't it? It really gives us something to look back on. I mean, we had a great time in Birmingham that weekend, and it's nice to have something tangible, isn't it, alongside the pictures and photographs uh, to, to it remind certainly us of is. a wonderful yeah. weekend. Uh, well, Lynn McKinnon replied to that, saying, Oh, this looks amazing. Shame I wasn't a podder sooner. Otherwise, uh, looks like I've missed out on a great experience. Well, well, but you get to experience it too with us now, don't you, Lynn? That's exactly, cool. and you can relive it whenever you like or live it for the first time and then relive it, so yeah, it's all exciting. Right. 
Uh, now, finally, for now, uh, Tom Hodden. I mean, it's been a while since we've done this, isn't it, oh, Jamie? what? Because this week, over on our Facebook group, he posted a quick fire five. <laughs> it's probably been so long, we've probably lost the sound effect, haven't we, for that? But let's see how we go. <laughs> now, here's a quick fire five for you, Jamie. It looks, says Tom, uh, like we're going into infinity, but what madness waits beyond the black hole? Number one, would you rather fight one human-sized torchy or a swarm of action figure-sized torchies? <laughs> action figure torchies, maybe? Really? A swarm of them? Yeah, but all over you. Yeah, but I feel like I could crush them and break them, whereas wow. a big torchy would be whoa, just okay. spooky. Which anomaly would you prefer to investigate? Planet of the Mitches or a moon sized Xeroid? Oh, moon sized Xeroid. That'd be fun. Yeah, that's it? like uh, Into the Dalek, that Doc 2 episode. Oh. <laughs> yes. <laughs> See, that's great. That's giving me an idea for a script. Are you still oh. making Terror audios? <laughs> I would consider it. <laughs> Number three. Uh, what uh, is that strange signal from Planet Meta? Brian the Brain downloading the latest Call of Duty update or the Lavender Castle tourist information hotline? <laughs> what? Oh, that'll be Brian. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, number four, you meet Brian Blessed on an alien world. What do you do? Offer him a ride in an eagle with no hints that he might randomly turn into a skeleton or blow up his lair and elope with his shape-changing daughter. <laughs> oh, God, that's not much of a choice, is it? I suppose if I have to elope, I might as well. Yeah, yeah. these are great. And finally, sorry, guys, it doesn't look like you're getting a TV show, so where do we find your adventures? Comic strips in Lookin, the Kids TV Times, or in an annual and toy line? <laughs> what? Annual and toy line? <laughs> yeah, of course it's got to be an annual and toy line. Of That's course. Fantastic. And there we are. <sighs> uh, a quick return for Tom Hodden's Quick Fire 5. And just as quick an exit, one hopes. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. So thanks for that, Tom. Yes, do sure. join in. I know we say it every week, but they're a lovely bunch of people and you can literally post whatever you like. You know, if you're a mad Anderson fan and you feel like you don't quite fit in somewhere anywhere else because people don't quite understand your passion for this, you know, this is the place. Honestly, no judgment. Post pictures of you in your cosplay, your merch, your Ander shelves. You'll be enthralled by the amount of love and support you get. Uh, so why not join in? Blooming neck. Yes, I agree. Yes. True, yep, yep, yep. Nicest place on the internet. Uh, yep. And, and avoids all that toxicity which seems to come oh, in so many groups. Yeah. It's, it's blooming marvellous and a testament yeah. to our lovely Podstron. So, yes, Probably. I'm talking to you, Podstron. Yes, you <laughs> can nod away there and smile. Mm-hmm. Yes, keep nodding. That's you. Yeah, That's brilliant. You. Yeah. Uh, anyways, a reward for your brilliance, Podstrons. I've got an interview for you, and it's not one oh. that I've done for a well, change. That, that is a reward, isn't it? <laughs> it's a relief for everyone, <laughs> including the interviewee. Uh, <laughs> yes, this week, uh, bless him, Ben Page, our lovely producer, has done an interview with, uh, well, name you might know, Richard, possibly, and certainly Postrons you may well know. Certainly, if you've ever collected cult TV shows or films on disc, oh yeah, the chances sure. are pretty high that oh, you'll I know, find... Kim Newman. On those, yeah. yeah, multiple interviews with Kim Newman. Yeah. So he's contributed to an astonishing, astounding number of releases from Adam Adamant to Zombie Flesh Eaters and everything in mm-hmm. between. I mean, that's mm-hmm. quite an A to Z list there, isn't it? Yeah, it really uh, is, yeah. He's written countless articles and non-fiction books, plus uh, for narratives, for TV, film, audio, and even comics. Even fiction books like the right. Anno Dracula series. Yeah. So here he is, our incredibly prolific and slightly spooky guest, Kim Newman for part one of two. (laughs) Well, I'm Ben Page here for the Jerry Anderson podcast, and I'm here with Kim Newman. Kim, who who is Kim Newman? For those who don't Uh, know. I I always introduce myself as novelist and critic. Uh, That's basically what I do. Um, I'm the author of the Anno Dracula series of novels and Something More Than Night and Professor Moriarty, The Hound of the D'Urbervilles and a whole bunch of other um, works of fiction. Uh, I'm a film critic with Empire Magazine and Sight and Sound Magazine in the UK. uh, And I've also written a whole bunch of books about uh, film and television. Um, I wrote a book called Nightmare Movies about the history of, of the modern horror film uh and generally i turn my hand to to uh everything i mean i've I've written bits of radio and television as well yeah you're you're incredibly prolific and you work 
in in a wide a wide range of, of stuff. So there's a there's a lot to cover when we're talking about your career. But I think you you summed yeah. it up well. It divides into into the creative track, yeah, and also they, the critical track. Yeah, they bleed together. I have to say, I I, I think quite a lot of my my fiction. I mean, I, I the last novel I had out is uh, uh, something more than nine. Is about Hollywood in the 1940s. So there's a lot of film stuff in there as well, and uh, all uh, quite a lot of my fictions of draws on things that I'm interested in writing about in the media as well. Hmm. Now, I, I should apologize before we get any further. If you hear any banging, it's because they decided to do some construction while I was <laughs> scheduled to do Fair an enough. interview. So, oh, uh, well, not poltergeist then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, it's not poltergeist, we promise. Yeah. Even though we are recording this, we're getting close to Halloween. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, uh, what, it, what? It is, however, Friday the 14th. Not Friday the 13th. Yes, we, we so missed we'll, it narrowly yeah. after Thursday missed the 13th it, yeah. yesterday. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Kim, Kim, what first drew you to, I don't know, the, the fantastic and science fiction and all this kind of stuff? How did it begin? Uh, well, I'm a, a child of the, the 1960s. And I, probably my first experience of the fantastic in all forms would actually have been 1960s television. Uh, the first television program I can remember seeing uh, was at the first episode of the second Dalek serial on Doctor Who wow. uh, in 1964. Uh, and I, uh, throughout the 60s, I mean, uh, we're Obviously, you talk about Jerry Anderson. His works loomed very, very large in my childhood, um, along with stuff like The Man from Uncle and the Avengers and uh, Marvel Comics, the, mm. the, you know, the, the original Stanley, Jack Kirby, Steve Ditko era of Marvel Comics. Um, although, to me, The Avengers was always um, Patrick McNeil and, and uh, Diana Rigg rather than Giant Man and that crowd. Um, and this, there's a weird thing, and I, I suspect it's to do with the demographic tyranny of the baby boom, mm. of which I came in at the very, very end of. But all the things we loved as kids are still franchises all these years later. They keep coming back. They won't go away. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, and things like Doctor Who and Star Trek and James Bond and Marvel Comics are still huge. They're still big. They're still huge, active franchises. Whereas the franchises of my parents' era are things like Tarzan or The Lone Ranger, which have had periodic revivals, but it seems to me that their time is past. That they, they have gone. They're, the context that created those things um the pulps radio uh and have have passed us by mm -hmm. whereas the stuff from the 1960s and, and even i mean and and not just the um yeah films television comics books music of course yeah it's the, the era of beetle mania as well as bat mania uh both of which i lived through as a, as a child all of those things are still here. They're still rough. They've mutated. They're unrecognizable. But it means that, that, that I, I, I know grumpy old gits like me are still sort of deeply bound up. I can have arguments with 11-year-olds yeah. about you know, uh, what, uh, what the ultimate form of the Hulk is. You know, It's like, um, and, and I don't know if this is entirely a healthy thing. I do think, I suppose... <laughs> The, the generation after me had Star Wars. Mm -hmm. um, and so the franchises have kept coming. And, there's, and, after, and Star Wars is a 1970s thing, basically. And now, currently, people have sort of, there's still things from the 80s, like uh, The Terminator. Yeah, it, it's still, or Alien, which I suppose started in 1979. But those are still active as, as franchises, premises. There's still endless spin-offs from that that stuff. So maybe, it, it, but it seems to me that my childhood produced more that has become 
permanently or long-lastingly a part of popular culture. And I'm interested in that as a, as a cultural commentator, as much as as a consumer, as, a, as a, an unabashed fan. As you pointed out, I do actually have like a model of Stingray back there. You know, yes, you certainly do. Like, but but I uh, and, and I I have the yeah the new uh, Blu-ray box set with all the spanky special editions and all all that kind of stuff. Um, and I do regularly watch this stuff for pleasure as well as for academic interest but there are uh things of academic interest that are, are very pressing to me very much so yeah and you, you touched on it there with mm. talking about how some of those things from before haven't mm. endured as well as things from the 60s mm. you, you mentioned doctor who i'm curious <laughs> there sometimes seems to be a division in households from that time where there were mm. itv households and bbc households but you yeah, mentioned shows true. from both were you an itv yeah i do and if anything, we would pro- my family would probably have been a BBC household. My dad, I think, to the end of his life, disapproved of adverts. He felt that they were an imposition. Um, I, but I, I remember we would watch. Uh, we were the thing is we were um, late adopters of television. I said I remembered seeing that episode of, of Doctor Who. I saw that at my grandma's house, uh-huh. uh, and reconstructing the past i think my sister and i were so interested in finding out how the story turned out the next week that my parents bought a television set uh, oh, wow i know that uh we saw the second episode of that serial at a neighbor's house in the block of flats where we live but the, by the third episode uh the newman family had a television set um and it that may well have been the spell i think my um uh, uh my my parents were artists and i think they slightly disapproved of the whole idea of television i think it took a long time for them to get around to it so we were not a household that automatically had the television on all the time like many of my friends um houses where you went round there the television was on in our house we would turn the television on if we wanted to watch something in particular um and yeah, we we consumed all kinds of uh, uh, stuff. I mean, there were there were uh, for a long time in my childhood actually only two accessible television channels. So uh, which we bumped up to three when we were finally able to tune into BBC Two. Um, so I watched a lot of uh, probably unsuitable stuff as a child as well. But yeah, we um, I I was certainly as a as the kind of kid who was interested in in sort of science fiction and monsters and stuff like that, I would happily watch. Um, yeah, I whatever whatever channel it was on, I would I would tune in and, and watch. And and there were, I suppose, the film. It was. I mean, I even remember. Of course, there were film spin-offs of um, Doctor Who and Batman and, and uh, Thunderbirds. Yeah, yeah I, I, and I and and I remember seeing all those as a child, along with the sort of the later Sean Connery Bond films and weird things like in Britain, we would get um, the, the two part episodes of the man from uncle would be spliced together and released as feature films. Yes. And that was the kind of thing I saw. And of course the, the, before star Wars, we had Ray Harryhausen movies. Yeah. Uh, and that, that was a big thing. For, for my generation of kids it's like i remember when he got his um his special academy award uh tom hanks gave it to him and he said in his his introduction that no matter about all the arguments about citizen kane for him jason and the argonauts would always be the best film ever made yeah. and i kind of get that I, 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 I although for me it was first men in the moon which was the first film i was taken to see wow. uh, was the the, the uh, the moment of wonder that introduced me to yeah the, the media and actually it's so perfect the first film for me because it's not just Ray Harryhausen it's H.G. Wells and Nigel Neal both of whom huge influences on me personally as a as a writer and I yeah. still see so many elements of that 
that one film experience uh, seeping into my work. But of course, years later, I realized that it wasn't the first film I saw. The first film I saw was East of Sudan, which was the B picture on that on that double bill. Oh, um, right, and, right. and that's a very unmemorable film, uh, yeah. although I have seen it subsequently. Um, I have a poster of that double bill. Uh, it's interesting how too. memory works yeah. that way, how it'll yeah. it'll edit out the, the parts that we don't want to remember or promote yeah. something to the so top. I, I, and I went back and I did, years later, somebody at some, uh, the Barbican in, in London had a series of critics introducing films that are important to them. And I recreated that double bill and, and, and oh, showed wow. it. And so I was able to, to uh, see it all the way through because, in fact, the first, <laughs> my sister, is probably fed up of hearing this story, but the first time we went and saw it, she's a little younger than I am, but she had hysterics uh, in the in the cinema, and we had to leave. And I must have been sternly nagging my parents for like days uh, to be taken back so I could see the end of that that film. Um, and 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 my dad took me without. Sasha, my sister, to, to see the, the whole film. I'm giving slightly um, a um, a wrong impression of how <laughs> how malleable my parents were. They certainly <laughs> weren't uh, in in in, in, in uh, open to screaming and shouting and nagging and stabbing feet and all that kind of stuff. We weren't we were not like that as, as kids. However, in those two instances, um, both of which I suppose were kind of important to me. Yeah, you know, in generating who I would later become and all, and what I would later, you know, the entire course of my life. Mm-hmm. Um, Do you I think them, sort of them being artists stuff had like an that. influence on you? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Um, I mean, uh, um, you can, um, apart from anything else, the, the arguments that most of my contemporaries had with their parents about entering unconventional professions they had already had with their own parents right. so i was never told to you know get a backup accountancy degree and all that kind of stuff like that. i had the, the full but also i had the experience of knowing what it was like to work for yourself and be a freelance and all that that mm. kind of stuff which i think a lot of people have to gr- you know grow out of they have to go through a more conventional uh, period of employment and be unhappy. I mean, I, a friend of mine went and worked in a bank for a year and was miserable and then changed his life and then and, and became a writer. Uh, yeah. And I, I, but I didn't do any of that. So that's the, a, a big influence for all kinds of stuff um, uh, just to do with their interest. My dad was actually uh, very interested in movies. I, I, mm. I think when I became interested in, in films as a, as a, young teenager uh, I, th- I he, he thought it was great he had an excuse to go and see art movies again all that, that right. kind of stuff. Uh, i mean and my my parents were art students in the 1950s so mm. the, that sort of beatnik existential era uh is still something i'm very kind of attached to yeah uh, it's, it's interesting that you say that they were very <laughs> interested in films but they, <laughs> they were kind of suspicious of television Yes, I I don't know particularly why. Um, I think it, it it may just have been an unnecessary expense. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's interesting because the, the Thunderbirds yeah. films they they mm-hmm. made the TV show, of course, mm-hmm. and then they made the film subsequently and mm-hmm. expected the films to do really well. Yeah, they didn't do as well as they were expecting. They didn't. So. No, I'm not. I I think that that was true of all the. Uh, the the film spin-offs but as a child you don't realize if something isn't uh, a box office flop if you went and saw it right yeah um and I, the same i think is true of the, the doctor who films uh i think that the um the adam west Bat- batman film did really well mm-hmm. uh, but that but that was another one and it, it's it's rather misleading because those shows got film spin-offs almost nothing else did that was right. big in the in the, the 1960s it's like uh, uh yeah it was it was a weird fluke and and a, a few other american shows did batman from uncle thing of releasing a feature version of their two-part episodes i remember there's a mission impossible film which is a two-part episode spliced again it was released theatrically um although i think i didn't see that until a bit later um but it was just part of the, the media landscape of, 
of the time. I don't. I I also have to say that I that my experience of the uh, the Super Mario Nation shows was very much the enhanced experience you got because I was a uh, an early subscriber to TV Twenty One. Uh, uh, yes. So I had the comic as well, plus the the records. I remember being really big. I had the a trip to Marineville and all the the um, the, the, four, the the I suppose they were EPs technically. Uh-huh. Uh, with not just the music, but the little playlets, and and even the one where you could um, read in the part of, of Troy Tempest. Uh, oh, wow. All those. I mean, I had those, but that didn't make me unusual. I mean, and and this, I think, it, is a a thing that's kind of hard to get. Is that it wasn't odd to be a kid and be interested in all this stuff then. You weren't marginalized as a geek in the way that some later generations have sort of stereotyped an interest in science fiction because everybody was. It's like you would have been odd in my class if you weren't into this stuff. I think quite a lot of it had to do with the space program. Um, Yeah, that we were the generation that watched all the way from um, the, the Mercury through Gemini to Apollo to the moon landing mm-hmm. to to Apollo thirteen, yeah, all that, and and that was as much an obsession with my generation as say football. Uh, it was a, a, it's probably under estimated as a cultural influence on on the 1960s now it seems so much part of the the past it's hard to remember that it was so omnipresent i mean it, you can see it in um, all the space themed snacks and you know the, uh, the you look at the advert, adverts of the time and they all try and sort of talk up the the, the connection with the moon or whatever <laughs> yeah do you remember the first time you encountered, was it TV 21 that you found first, or do you think you saw it on an Anderson show on television? Oh, I know. I, I, it's, I, I, I was a little too young for Supercar and Four Feather Falls, although I have very mi- vivid memories of Torchy, Torchy the Battery Boy for some <laughs> reason. I think that must have been like a one-off couple of episodes and Twizzle as well. Yeah. I, I, I I think they may have repeated that at some point. I came in with Fireball XL5. That's where I started on Jerry Anderson. And I always think that because the shows got more sophisticated, and it was so every year I would come back and it would go from Fireball to Stingray to Thunderbirds to Captain Scarlet. I mean, that's basically my childhood. Uh, and I remember watching Joe Dante and not, uh, Joe 90 and not quite getting it. Mm. And then UFO, which I did like a lot. And then by the time Space 1999 came on, I, I was, yeah, I'd moved on to other stuff that I was interested in. And so I, I, I still to this date haven't watched it all the way through, although I do have it around here somewhere. Um, but for me, it is that that span between Fireball and Captain Scarlet, uh, where, where the aesthetic changes subtly over the four shows, and sometimes not so subtly, and becomes it's obviously straining to become a little more grown up, a little more adult, um, and actually very dark um, at a time when, uh, yeah, obviously I, my tastes are maturing and changing <laughs> with with the years. Um, Looking back on them, I mean, and I, and I have watched, uh, I haven't systematically watched through the whole run in, in some years, but I've looked at, at bits and pieces of them. What I, um, I, I now really admire the, uh, the scripting and the way um, actually quite complicated stories are, 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 are told in a 25-minute format. Uh, and it's only recently that the shows have started looking dated. I think that their design of a future uh, held up for decades in terms of uh, an imaginary look at what the world might be. I mean, uh, even though I've, stuff like kidney-shaped swimming pools or now, I have a sort of retro cool uh, 
Rat Pack kind of vibe. But I think that they, strangely, the things that date most are the things where they try to do sort of topical references, the the occasional musical thing episodes. Um, But stuff, uh, just the, uh, the, the hardware still looks good. It is, it is a tribute to the design that it, that it holds up so well. Mm. Do you yeah. Remember, what do you uh, remember about Fireball XL5? Is that when you started to get the comics, or did you get the comics later? I, I'm Fireball XL5 was was still running, wasn't it? When the, the when TV Twenty One came out, uh, so I must have got. I, and I got TV Twenty One, I think, from like the first issue. Of course, oh, wow. being a kid, I didn't keep them. Yeah, I mean, I know people who've like reassembled their own collections on eBay because print runs on comics was huge then. Yes. but they weren't. They didn't even have staples. Yeah, so <laughs> they they came apart. Yeah, I mean, they were like newspapers. Yeah, uh, and I I didn't even think to keep them week to week. I think we all swapped them, and every. Uh, like dentist offices had big stacks of comics, and yeah. in in um, our junior school, I think yeah, you know, there was a room for when it was raining and you couldn't go outside, and people had dumped all their old comics. I should have stolen a lot of them, should never. But the things we didn't think like that then. So I, I certainly, um, I remember actually being really impressed with the Fireball XL five strip in uh, uh, TV twenty one, which. Looking back at it now, actually, is a little more adult and frightening than the show was. It did some really good scary stuff. There's a a series with uh, kind of uh, killer snowmen mm-hmm. who actually are astronauts wrapped in in snow. Yeah. Which I realise I've used that image in a couple of stories as well. <laughs> it stuck with me so long from that strip, which I must have read when I was about six. And I didn't see again until very recently, mm-hmm. but that image had stuck with me, and I and I used actually I used it in my uh, my one uh, contribution to the the Doctor Who franchise. I wrote a novella called Time and Relative, and that has Killer Snowmen in it, uh, which are absolutely stolen from <laughs> or it's unconsciously influenced right. by that Bible XL5 strip. I, I, I feel slightly um, <laughs> yeah, uh, justified in that um, Stephen Moffat later used them in a, in a TV episode and didn't credit me. So, yes, yeah. that's, that's true. There, there is that Killer yeah. Snowman episode. Yeah. Yeah, so, but I wrote that in Doctor Who first, but I stole it from Bible XL5. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. Well, they they say that uh, the idea in, in one of the ideas in Fireball XL five was the oxygen pills, right? This mm-hmm. idea that you could just take a pill and, and go for a yeah. spacewalk and be fine. Yeah. Uh, supposedly, that was an idea contributed by Terry Nation. So. All right. Yeah. Yeah. That makes a sort of sense. I mean, it's it's ludicrous, of course, but it's not that different from the. Um, the process you see in uh, the abyss of uh, mm-hmm. where you uh, fill your lungs with oxygenated water in order to breathe underwater. I mean, it's, it's a sort of a lot of the science stuff in the Anderson shows is not terrible. Yeah, yeah. it's not. It, it, I mean, it's actually better than than um, certainly Star Wars, but actually, mm. it's probably better than Star Trek. In in in, in it, the uh, there's a sort of feeling that British television even on ITV, had a kind of public service remit. So they would quite often um, bring on sort of boffins as, co- as consultants, some of whom, I mean, actually had, had sort of quite distinguished careers as, as, yeah, um, as scientists and as um, fiction writers. Um, yeah. uh, Fred Hoyle or um, Arthur Clarke or Patrick, Patrick Moore uh, are all sort of biggish names. Uh, and they they would tinker on on kids shows like this because they thought it was good for the culture. Hmm. Um, I'm good friends with Stephen Baxter, Stephen M. Baxter in America, the science fiction writer, mm-hmm. and he's for him Jerry Anderson was a huge formative experience. If you haven't had him on, you should. And he should um, has spent quite a bit of time thinking about the science of the, the shows and sort of. Uh, 
how it relates to real science. I, mean, I, think, I, think, I think it's his dream to, to, to reboot it all as hard science fiction. But, uh, yeah. Of course, the the real scientific question was how did they get the trolley back? You know, five yeah, yeah. So five launching on yeah. the rail and then the yeah. trolley. Uh, the, 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 those wonderful uh, repeated launch sequences, which you got in Stingray and Thunderbirds as well. Yes. Yeah, I mean, uh, the the ritual. I think we all love doing that. Uh, I, I I think everybody, uh, yeah, tried to rig up like cardboard. <laughs> equivalents of Thunderbird 2 and, and, and the slides in their gardens. I don't, I don't think anyone ever managed to, to really create it properly, but it was it was a thing that kids did. Yeah. When they made Stingray, they had a little bit more money and they were filming mm. in color, but I, I'm guessing yeah, you wouldn't have seen it in did. color. No, no. It, it, I, I can't remember. I think it may even have said in color on the black and white uh, yeah. prints we in saw. In color. In video color, and the weird, and the thing is that it color television didn't actually exist in Britain uh, until the very late nineteen sixties. Um, I and uh, like many households, we didn't get a color television until the late nineteen seventies. Um, black and white was still a dominant mode. In the, uh, I don't know if you, you pay attention, or or if there's an American equivalent of of this but whenever um sort of right wingers complain about work shy scroungers now they always say oh and they've got smartphones and flat screen televisions and netflix subscriptions it used to be color television was the right. absurd luxury yes that um the people who shouldn't really afford have uh, have uh -huh. spent <laughs> the money out of um and uh, it, it's also it is a uh, probably true that as a, 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 a kind of a status symbol, color television hung around it, and actually the first color televisions looked terrible. I mean, it, it was <laughs> yeah, um, and yeah, uh, and British color television looked better than American color television for a long time because yeah. uh, 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 because I think Britain. Britain had the TV format of 1946, and America had the TV format of 1938, um, mm -hmm. and that's and that's the number of lines you got until yeah. Um, again, I'm probably only in the last 10, 20 years that that's changed. Yeah, but yeah, so we all we all saw this stuff in in black and white, but because of TV 21 and annuals and jigsaws and toys and all that stuff, we all knew what color the Thunderbirds were supposed to be. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and certainly uh, the, uh, the color actually on, uh, on particularly on Stingray is gorgeous, but yes. uh, in the, the new Blu-ray edition yeah, show that it's almost, what what a wasteful amount of effort they put in making this thing beautiful. <laughs> yeah. When I mean, I, I when actually even in America, color te television wasn't uniform. Uh, no. at, at the time, Stingray was made. Quite a lot of high end American television was still in black and white. That's true. Um, and presumably, the idea was that there would be you know overseas sales. I I think they may also started to have a sense that there was a longevity to this material, that it would be re-shown over and over again. But it wasn't instantly repeated the way hit shows were. What it was is it came back. Um, and it's almost like every you know, 10, 15 years or so. Uh, my nephew, who's about 30 now, when he was eight, he got interested in all the same shows I did because they were all back on television. <laughs> yeah, they all got uh, repeated so in the 90s. Yeah, that's right. And so a whole new generation of kids went out and bought models of Tracy Island and all that kind of stuff. Um, and I, I, I suspect that that was the last time it was possible for that to happen because it was dependent on broadcast television. Um, the availability of this stuff, and I don't, I, off the top of my head, I couldn't tell you whether any of this material was available on any of the streaming channels. I'm sure it's all over YouTube, um, but I don't know if there are like legitimate 
streaming avenues to to watch this stuff. But even so, that would be diffused. It's not the same as a show being on television, kids watching it on Saturday mornings or whatever. Yeah. Uh, and then that creating a craze. I think in order to have a cultural phenomenon, you kind of need everybody to be watching it at once. Yeah. And it's hard to see whether streaming platforms are even capable of generating that. I know there have been hits. Mm-hmm. Um, Stranger Things is an obvious one, right. but I don't know that they've got the the cultural penetration. Yeah, that a you know, even a you know um, a Star Trek or or a Doctor yeah. Who or a Thunderbirds had. Well, if you uh, have if you have three networks to choose between, yeah, yeah, then... yeah that's right. You you watched it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, another thing I remember ITV doing, which was I think was their idea of bank holiday children's mm-hmm. programming. Hmm. was that they would have an episode of every one of the Anderson series to date in a marathon. So that's probably when I would have seen odd episodes of Supercar and Hmm. and Torchy. And so they would start with those in the morning and work through to whatever the current one was. Um, I didn't know about those. That's interesting. Hmm. A lot lot of the Anderson shows are streaming on Breadbox now. And because because it was ITV, um, which is not a network. I'm sure those practices varied, but certainly my ITV region did that. Yeah. Oh, well, he'll be back for part two next week. Thank you, oh, Kim, good. and thank you, Ben. Yeah. Great. Uh, you can find Kim uh, via his website mm-hmm. at johnnyalucard.com. Okay. Spell Johnny that Alucard. Uh, well, it's J. O H N N Y A L U C A R D dot com. I guess Kim Newman dot com was taken. Uh, mm. Or you can find him on Twitter at uh, at Anno Dracula A N N O Dracula. If you like a good vampire yarn, Titan Books oh, yeah. has just released a 30th anniversary edition of Anno Dracula. Plus, you can still find copies of the very Jerry Anderson influenced book uh, in the series Anno Dracula 1999 Daikaiju. So, okay, <laughs> spell that again. <laughs> Daikaiju, D- D-A-I-K-A-I-J-U. Oh, right. Because nice. kaiju are the big uh, Japanese monsters, aren't they? I think. Okay, the massive okay, oversized gotcha. ones that yeah. qu- just stomp around cities and things. I see. Right. I'm, I'm still trying to think of a pun about a good vampire yarn. Mm. You know, maybe that's what they use to sew up their socks or something. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. yeah I you know that. what I mean? Yeah, yeah. yeah something... I know we're a, a week late, but anyway. Uh, yeah. Could have come um, in useful last week, couldn't it? Drac- yeah. Dracula's jumper, something. Yeah, something yeah. Like that, yeah. Anyway, shall we Anywho. move on? Yeah, let's move on. Yeah. <laughs> uh, now, if you're on the internet, you might have heard of Twitter. <laughs> of course they're on the internet. <laughs> they listen to a podcast. Uh, uh, and if you've heard of Twitter, well, you might have tweeted us and hashtagged us Jerry Anderson Podcast. We can, but uh, hope. Like these uh, happy tweeters have done. Uh, Peach, for example, says, I've just listened to your Unwinnie's tribute intro to the Jerry Anderson podcast number 41. <laughs> that was some time ago, wasn't it? Bravo. Yeah, yeah. She says that was great. Hey, but that seems like yesterday. I can't believe that was part 41 when we did that. <gasps> Extraordinary. It is. Yeah, it seems unbelievable mm. how many podcasts yeah. have passed since then. Yeah, weird. Uh, this, uh, oh, do you know, I haven't written down who tweeted this, but you might recognise yourself. If, like me, you love all things Jerry Anderson TV or just love classic television, I highly recommend listening to the weekly Jerry Anderson podcast hosted by Jamie Anderson, Richard James and Chris Dale. 90 minutes or so of fun, nostalgia, new stuff and other gubbins. A real treat. So thank you, anonymous tweeter. You're only anonymous because I didn't I make it over who it was. They're not anonymous because no. they were anonymous. No. It's because you didn't yeah. do the job right. properly. No, but that's it. It, Fair Whoever they are, they're clearly wonderful with a tweet Quite like right that. Uh, Lost in Transition tweeted uh, Chris uh, at Chris Dalek saying, I just heard your random Jerry Anderson episode, picked at random from the vaults and your random comments on that bit of the Jerry Anderson podcast, whose name I can't remember. Space 1999 Breakaway, you absolute beauty. Yeah, you see, I think a lot of people were waiting for that one. Yes, yeah. Well, there's some kind of iconic episodes yeah. uh, Particularly pilot episodes, which I'm sure people are really looking forward to hearing Chris's take yep. on. So that's right. I'd like to know, Potterstrons, is there still an episode of a Jerry Anderson uh, series that hasn't yet appeared on the Randomizer that you're really looking forward to and hoping is going to come along soon? Let us know. Podcast at jerryanderson.com. Stuart Moyer on Twitter says, "Highlighted by Monday morning, hearing that I'm listening to an Anderson Entertainment production." 
<laughs> it's time for the Jerry Anderson podcast. Ah, uh, isn't that nice? Uh, but John Haycock says, uh, or Hancock rather, says, "Help! I've got the theme tune to Fireball XL5 stuck in my head, and I want it gone." <laughs> Why? Why would you want it gone? Well, isn't the cure for getting rid of an earworm to listen all the way to the end or yep. sing all the way to the end to the final bit? So That's if you go to, when what was it, Pod 222 maybe, where I oh, yeah. sang in inverted commas <laughs> oh, yeah, the Fireball help. theme, I've got all the verses there and that might yeah. Yeah. get you to the end possibly. I think it will. I think it will. I think you'll, yeah, that'll be it. It'll be gone forever. Uh, Christopher Kai, uh, still on Twitter, says, tip of the hat to Jerry Anderson and Sylvia Anderson for helping inspire and nurture my childhood imagination whilst helping nudge itty-bitty me to expand my horizons beyond mundanity with Aww. shows like UFO, Space 1999 and Captain Scarlet. That's rather profound, isn't Beyond it? Beyond mundanity uh, is quite a, quite a nice phrase. <laughs> ah, yeah, it is. I'm going to use that in my next novelization. And finally, <laughs> Sam Cho Panza says, uh, well, posted a picture from uh, 18th of April 1958 edition of the Coventry Evening Telegraph. A picture of Robert, r- rather Roberta Lee, uh, with Twizzle and Footso the Cat from The Adventures of Twizzle, directed by Jerry Anderson. Only one of the 52 episodes survive. And ain't that the truth? But a lovely picture, nonetheless. It is, and uh, a great shame there's only one. I mean, yeah, most probably of course not it is. Really, no, really it is. No, really. No, it, it is. is. No, it is. Yeah. Uh, so there we are. Yeah, do join in the fun on Twitter as well. Hashtag us Jerry Anderson podcast. Uh, tagging me, Richard and James. Him over there, I'm Jerry Anderson. And him over there by the red button, Chris Dalek. Oh. And uh, I'll read out your tweets next time. Yes. Well, I look forward to that. I'm sure all of the Twitterers will as well. I, th- I thought you almost called them twits earlier on, didn't you? When I you did were not. Out. I- no. I think you might have done. No, I would never do that. Well, well doesn't our, our new Lord, Lord and Master, Elon Musk, call himself uh, Chief Twit now? So. Uh, does he? Does he? Yeah, yes. Yeah. Anyway, uh, moving mm. on from there. Uh, no, I think we should. Uh, you mentioned Chris <laughs> Dalek over there with his big I red did. button. Well, there he he's is. here for the randomizer, which is coming up momentarily, where he or someone else or something or whatever presses the red button or they choose a random episode of a random Jerry Anson show. And uh, Chris says things about it. And that's why it's called the randomizer, because of the oh, random nature of I the see. selection. So now I get it. Without, right. It's only taking you 230 yeah, bars. Yeah, I see. Without further ado, shall we hand over to the randomizer for the randomizer? Oh. Ah, yeah, because it's random, you see. Yes, ah. yeah, 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 move on. Got it. It's random. Okay, yeah. Okay, over to you, randomizer. Randomizer, right, right. <sighs> Come along, lad, pick yourself up. Quite right, Zero. Yes, hello, everybody. Sorry, no time for a full introduction today, as we're back with Thunderbirds for End of the Road. You get that voice circuit fixed as soon as we get back. Oh, charming. <laughs> Uh, oh my goodness. Sorry. Sorry, everybody. Hello. I am here. Sorry. Um, I... <laughs> oh dear. Okay. Very odd thing happened there. I, uh, I put the episode on and I just completely forgot I was supposed to be talking over it. <laughs> I was sat back just sort of ready to watch it and then I realised, oh yeah, I'm supposed to be talking over this. You'd think after, what is it, 230 weeks, you'd think by now I would know what I'm supposed to be doing here. Anyway, welcome back to the Randomizer. It's Thunderbirds. It's end of the road. It's got a really nice episodic incidental music score, this one. Let's get that out of the way. Some lovely, graceful building swells here in particular. This is proper feature film stuff from Barry Gray. It's just gorgeous as we uh, meet this road construction crew who are uh, blasting their way through uh, a pair of mountains. Led by Eddie. The atomic charges are cutting through completely in line with the survey. Hmm. Okay, Chang. Fire the remaining two. You're our Asian guy, Chang. Yeah, I like that uh, a lot of the... You don't see them in this scene so much as later, but Eddie Hausman, for it is he, who is wearing a hat with his name on, but it's got the name in quotation marks. It's not just Eddie, it's Eddie, as if, you know, that's sort of a nickname or something. I think later on we see more of these guys wearing their hats. But... They've made it. They've blown up enough of the landscape to uh, to make it through to the other side. Bang on schedule. Yay. Great. Congratulations, Mr. Hausman. Mm. Thanks, boys. There'll be a good bonus for this. This is Kirano's uh, okay. slightly more energetic uh, cousin here, I'm guessing. But this explosives tractor as well. You've got to say right off the bat, this is a gorgeous little model. And it's not 
really sort of it's not like hugely eye-catching in the sense of say thunderbirds one or two or even the three or four it's just a a practical real world bit of industrial equipment but in you know in its design and its operation it's just gorgeous to look at which is good because we're going to be looking at this model quite a lot this week well we've made a pretty good job quite right to a pretty good job oh well except for the uh, the danger music and the uh, landslide oh no those uh, precariously balanced rocks at the top of that mountain are falling rock fall rock fall reverse back reverse back oh we can only reverse forwards no wiggle the lever that's it oh that was a close one. Oh no this is stop this is stop reverse or Re reverse back there we go Oh dear, that's close. Very close. Ooh, much wobbling on the puppet set there. Yeah, this is a pretty dangerous situation. And yet, for, considering that they've just cut their way through here with explosive charges, some very neatly uh, created cliff edges here for them to, uh, to have problems with later on. And of course, we've mentioned uh, End of the Road quite a few times recently. It's one of the playable uh, episodes that you can uh, experience for yourself in the, the new Thunderbirds cooperative card game, Danger Zone, which uh, I have a set here, but I haven't actually got around to playing it yet. But this is a, a pretty, not just a good episode of the series, this is an iconic episode of the series. Base. And speaking of, I think part of that is just the, the setup. Not just the, the rescue situation, which we'll get to later, but the whole Grey and Houseman, this gorgeous, uh, was it Pathfinder? I don't know, Grey and Houseman Construction Company, just giant monster vehicle. Um, brilliant idea as well as the, the little um, explosives truck goes through and does all the hard work, and this huge machine just comes along afterwards and uh, lays a road, pre-painted. Oh dear, a couple of familiar puppets there. Uh, oh, that's the French waiter from Perils of Penelope. Rock formations. Rain. He's got a bit of a deeper voice there, and uh, I can't remember. Oh no, the other guy was well, was one of the scientists in the Mighty Atom. Fire two and three. Yeah, lots of exploding things. So, there we go. That's got rid of the small obstruction. So small, I barely noticed it. But this is a cracking idea for a an international, you know, a Thunderbirds machine. Just this huge road building machine and it's so you know in keeping with the the slightly um unpleasant side of the thunderbirds world just uh nature oh screw that we've got a big machine that's going to just concrete over everything but the show isn't isn't too concerned with uh, ecological uh, aspects of um all this deforestation and such they're just happy with a job well done time they need to where to make the completion date yeah, it's a big organization with a couple of cool machines and a lot of people. Lovely sequence there of the, the tractor arriving back on the, the main vehicle and having to turn around in the, the vehicle bay. It's just wonderful stuff. And, that, and of course, this vehicle, I think, was re Eddie, did one purposed for uh, the transmitter truck. The mountain this side of the monsoons. Well, with any luck, we're going to make that date. Mm. Let's drink to that. But we were going to drink anyway, good or bad, so whatever. Contract. We fall down on this one, we've had it. Well, Eddie, you played your part, now I'll play mine. Here's a ticket to the Grauman Chinese Theatre. There's a poster for that on the wall behind the desk. I'm not sure what uh, what relevance that has to the uh, the road digging, road building company. And don't worry. Oh. Everything's gonna be all right, nothing can possibly go wrong. I'll say it before you can. Looking up an old friend. Ah, yes. Eddie Hausman here is going to uh, take a break from his road-building activities that are going so well to look up an old friend. Meanwhile, unrelated on Tracy Island, here's Tintin. Uh, our first glimpse into her bedroom, but oddly not the last. We see it again in Ricochet. Well, here it is, Tintin. Your bedroom. Oh, no. Grandma's made some clothes for her. It's beautiful. Now we must think of a special occasion for you to wear it. Or for a special person. Now, Mrs. Tracy, just who did you have in mind? Well, I know someone who's got you very much in mind. Young Alan's a mighty handsome boy. And I do like the way they use Grandma in this episode. It's it's quite rare that she's of 
use. I'm, I'm sorry to p- put it like that, but it's true. She rarely plays much of a role in the stories, aside from Move and You're Dead. Um, maybe she'll make the odd suggestion here and there. Otherwise, it's just apple pie all the way. So I like that there's a bit of matchmaking going on here. She's trying to... Uh, really sort of bring Tintin and Alan together a bit in this episode. But of course, who's coming this way by plane to spoil the fun? Well, say coming this way, but he seems to be approaching a a, a model island that doesn't look anything like Tracy Island. That was uh, coming in the land. quite an unfamiliar island there. It is coming in the land. Oh, no. Operation cover-up. Panic. I love how visitors to Tracy Island, no one seems to feel the need to phone ahead. Um, Because who was the last person who did this? It was uh, Tim Casey, wasn't it? Yeah. Made them think the island was under attack, even. Eddie's not going to do that. But, yeah, he's landing in the Greyhousman Company jet. Because, of course, they have a jet. They're a big company. And now everyone has to... uh, Well, (laughs) I get the impression they're sort of making you think that they've all rushed to look comfortable and as if they're not doing anything. But they were doing that anyway. Nobody does anything on Tracy Island except Brains and Grandma. Yeah, sly glances between Alan and Gordon over their newspapers there. Yeah, I think they're making a bit too much of this, really. <laughs> this um, pretend we weren't doing anything act. It doesn't take much work. I wonder who it can be. Oh, I don't know. It is. I hope they don't stay long. Yeah. Who could be here in the Grand Houseman Company jet? A gentleman to see you, Mr. Tracy. Uh, Mr. Eddie Hausman. <gasps> Ed- oh, so that's who Eddie was going to, to look up. Jeff! Or it could be Tintin, I suppose. Oh, lovely shot of Tracy Island by night. We don't see that too often in the show. Oh, gorgeous nighttime sky with a moon. Virgin and Gordon looking out over the sea, but someone is not happy about the presence of Mr. Hausman. In fact, he's turned the piano around. It's normally facing the wall. This time it's facing away from the wall. Say! Just so he can be seen moping a, a bit better, I guess. This is fun, though. You haven't heard, Virgil. Oh, this Prince Charming flew in and is really sweeping her off her feet. No! Yeah! Was he as handsome as I am, Gordon? Nearly, Virgil. Nearly. Yeah, this is great stuff, the teasing between the brothers. And I, obviously this is, um, I believe this is one of the episodes that were extended after the order came through to, um, to, to move the series from 25 minutes to 50. And this is an episode I really think that you could just sort of start it halfway through. You know, if, if you wanted to do a project where you took a Thunderbirds episode and best guest condensed it back to a 25 minute version you could just lop off the first half of this one good to be with you again Tintin. it's been a long time because it is just this all this character stuff on the front of the show like that fairly uh fairly functional dialogue there establishing that Tintin and eddie were a thing once where did they meet no idea how long ago was it who cares because he's here now and he's causing alan to put on his uh, grumpy face Oh, but lovely music as well, though. There's this speedboat. Yeah, Tintin and Eddie are taking a nighttime speedboat ride. And they've just come back to the jetty. It's just nice to see more of the island by night as well. It just looks so pretty. So it looks as though your company is going to make a go of it. I'm pleased for you, Eddie. Really, I am. Thanks, Tintin. Gus, we'll go broke if we don't finish that road on time. But things have gone great up to now. Say, I wish you could see our outfit. Really is great. Hmm. There's lots of guys in a big machine. Although Tintin being an engineer, she probably would be interested in the uh, the big machine. Not so much in the guys, necessarily. But what are they doing now? Come on. Come on. This is Bob Gray who's in uh, charge of the place. Oh, Lester, according to the weather reports, we're just going to make it. The rains are doing about two days. Yeah? And take a look at this. It's a wavy line I drew. Tremors in the mountains. Oh, no. What? How bad are they? Mountain tremors. Signals are faint, but that doesn't mean a thing. Let's go take a look for ourselves. And, of course, not only do they have a big ground machine and a little ground machine and a plane, they also have 
a lovely helijet and it's a particularly pleasing um color scheme on this one again it's the red and yellow it's lovely it's just lovely that it, across all of these vehicles for this one company you get this this idea that it is all one big organization it's it's little things like that that really help flesh out this world but i just love this model helijet anyway i love helijets i just love them especially this i think is it called a jumping jack in various spin-off media i'm not sure but this is the model helijet they used quite a bit more of this grand sweeping music it's just oh these shows were so lucky to have barry gray i mean they were so lucky to have so many of the people that worked on them but particularly barry gray just listen to that I also love that they make these mountains seem so much bigger than they are by making the Helijet model really tiny. More oh, Rockfall. I've seen enough. It's bad. Oh, it's even worse than that earlier thing that was bad. We'll never finish the road on time now. Oh no. Who jinxed it? Someone said nothing can go wrong. I bet it was that Eddie. Oh dear. Well, they've given up pretty easily. Everything seems doomed. I also like with this episode, as I said, we've got lots of these guest characters on board this uh, this road building machine. So much, so many different voices and accents that the guest cast are doing. And uh, oh, Tintin's got a picture of Eddie on her desk. Is that the same picture that later turns up on uh, Cass Carnaby's desk at the Paradise Peaks in the Cham Cham? Yes, Eddie gets around. I think you look beautiful. You've done your hair a different way. Yes. We... Do you like it, Father? Kirano's not used to this. Well, he he seems a nice young man. Having to give advice to his daughter. Going out again? Yes. In fact, even having to talk to his daughter is a, a rarity in Thunderbirds. Oh, no. Eddie's clearing off. And Tintin got all prettied up for him. Oh, poor Tintin. She's got a sad, frowning face on. He had some pretty bad news from the road camp, Tintin. And he couldn't even wait to say goodbye. Oh, well, he said goodbye to all of us, Tintin. Tintin, he'll write to you. Yeah, he'll get to you when he gets to you. Oh, poor Tintin. Well, that finishes Eddie as far as Tintin is concerned. Uh, the note of uh, <laughs> triumph in there, Scott, is uh, quite much. No, you know, be sympathetic. It's poor old Tintin. <laughs> Don't just say, oh, well, that's that then. Romance, it's not for me. We can't give up now, Bob. We can't. Eddie, it's too late. The rains have started. Then what do we do? Just sit here, let a landslide ruin all our work to date? That's what we do. Oh, no. And then in the spring? In the spring? That means we'll lose our contract. We'll just have to try and get an extension, that's all. It's all very believable dialogue. I say not only the, the way it's being performed, but the way this is being written as well. The date we said we would. This company. I think I've mentioned before somewhere about the uh, sort of. Plan for, work for, goes up in smoke. The the Wilfred Greater X um, effect. Uh, Wilfred Greater X, for those who don't know, was the creator and writer of the Plane Makers and the Power Game. These great boardroom dramas full of you know great British actors sort of yelling at each other. And there's a huge influence from those shows on Doppelganger and UFO and even 1999. Collapse at any second. But I think you can also see some of it in episodes like this. Blow while you were working on them. And yet it's it's very skillfully written in such a way that it appeals to a family audience. Job. And I know mine. Children are, are made aware of what's at stake, how important this is to these characters, but also how dangerous it is. It'll break us. Maybe. But you'll be alive. That's something I well, I suppose it's worth spending billions of dollars setting up again if we still have you. Oh, Eddie's not happy about that though. And speaking of not happy. Mind if I join you? Tintin's, um, well, you're not too happy. Alan's trying his best. I, I thought I'd like to do a little water skiing today. Would you like to join me? No, thanks. After everything he said, it's nice to see him trying his best here. Trying to cheer her up. mean that Eddie walking out like that? Ah. Mouth open, foot inserted. And there goes Tintin. Well done, Alan. What did I say? Just all the wrong things, Alan. As usual. Oh, dear. 
He doesn't get it, does he? But it's it, again, it's great to have this. What am I going to do? This subplot. Well, before that, Eddie came along. It's it's not even the Alan and Tintin side of it because we've seen that before and since. To me, Alan. Just leave things to me. It's Grandma's presence in the story. I really like that. It would have been. It would be so nice to see her get more to do in this show. And of course, that's Christine Finn playing Grandma and Tintin. And in that earlier scene, she was talking to herself there. Meanwhile, back at the construction camp, everyone's asleep. Yeah, so going back to mention of uh, Tintin's bedroom, now we're seeing inside Bob Gray's bedroom. Whereas we never see, like, Jeff's bedroom or Scott's bedroom. We see Virgil's and Alan's. Uh, and the one on, on Thunderbird 5. That might be it. Oh, and Penelope and Parker's and Tintin's, but... You know what I mean. You know what I mean. They've gone to a great deal of trouble to lay out Bob Gray's bedroom. Eddie snuck his head around the door, make sure he's asleep. Uh, I guess everyone must be asleep. Because he's going to do a very silly thing. I like that little bit of music as well. That bit of music reminds me of... Uh, when I was a kid, I had a cassette of Disney songs... And that is it. Is it Bambi? There's a song about rain, raindrops. It's just that those little toots on the flute there. Uh, assuming it is a flute, and I've not got the wrong instrument. They they remind me of, of something very old and very Disney. And I have a feeling it's Bambi. You weren't expecting to to get end of the road and uh, and hear me half remember Bambi, were you? But uh, there we are. So Eddie has got all his gear even his wrenches and spanners and he's gonna get out there with the explosives tractor by himself not even taking Chang how does he expect to get on without Chang and just yeah making off with the explosive tractor without telling anyone here it goes they also do a great job with this episode in particularly the second half when the the really bad weather sets in of making this a a really hostile environment just the constant rain the dark skies and the lightning the it's the visuals and also the sound design on this are just gorgeous and it's it's really an atmosphere and an environment that you just say you know no one in their right mind would ever want to go out and work in this you know it, it's dangerous enough without having all the bad weather as well but clearly eddie hausman well, let's not say he's not in his right mind, but uh, let's just say he hasn't run this past anybody. And that wavy line on the uh, seismograph is getting bigger. Mr. Gray, we're picking up an alarm signal. Oh, oh hello. It's the Eddie's done something stupid alarm. Yeah, I woke me too. I'll see you in the con oh, Eyelids on the Bob Gray puppet. Who I would have to assume that's not a blinking head, so those must be uh, plasticine eyelids. Very well disguised if it is plasticine. Yeah, even down to the, the the model shots, you know, this really muddy, soggy ground, and it's getting curled up on the uh, the tractor treads, and then shots like this of Eddie in the control room with the uh, the, the the window in front of him. We're, we're seeing it from the other side, just this glass streaming with water, and he's uh, yep heading his way up the mountain. Going to see if he can blow up the. Uh, the dangerous bit before it gets uh Rear tremors in the area of the cutting completely swamped glad i didn't let eddie go oh by the way where is he haven't seen him mr gray come to think of it it's not like him to sleep through an alarm call he said something about going to see the tractor find him whatever you do find him put on a circus um go to the beach open up a, a chocolate bar shop but whatever you do, find him! I just... Yeah, whatever you do, that's an odd line. It's always struck me as an odd line. Sing an opera, and then find him! Oh, things must be serious, though. He's got his hat with his uh, name in inverted commas on now to go outside. And I like as well that Eddie, for all that I've made fun of him here, is not presented as a stupid character. Which he so easily could be. You know, there's plenty of characters in these shows. Um, you know, shall we do this dangerous thing? Oh, it's fine. Let's do it. He's doing this because he knows it's important that there's more at stake than just his life. And three cases of charges. Oh, no. You fool, Eddie. 
And I like as well that he works for someone who who is more concerned about the lives of his people than getting the job done. Even if losing the job loses them so much money, he doesn't care. His people come first, and that's great. So it's a, it's a really nice and almost, I'd say, unusual uh, character dynamics for Eddie and Bob Gray. Um, not only their relationship together, but how they are as individuals. Now, Eddie is hanging off the side of the mountain. It's, again, just beautiful stuff. They've really done so much to establish this totally inhospitable environment. Kind of let down by, you know, the fact that you can't hide the sogginess of the wires. But, you know, it's what I said. If you're looking at the wires, then you're not concentrating on the story. Eddie, can you hear me? Yeah, this puppet must be absolutely drenched. The amount of water that's just being cascaded down the mountain on top of it. And yet, when you get the close-up on the face, as he continues to drill into the rock face, and he's just, you know, although it's a puppet, there's no change of expression, you really get the sense that this is a determined man. He's going to keep going no matter what. Music helps enormously with that as well. Oh, now the wavy line is extra wavy. Getting worse all the time. Mm. Hello, Eddie. Eddie! Is that Admiral Denver's medical report on the wall there as well? An hour. You'd better try again. I think it might be. Eddie! Yeah, I've, I've not got this on as big a screen as I might do. But yeah, there was a, a medical chart um, used on Ad from Admiral Denver in the Stingray episode Set Sail for Adventure. And it's what Jeff Tracy is holding in Trapped in the Sky. Um, I'm wondering if that's the same clipboard. Eddie! Then get out of there! That peak's cracking up! There'll be a landslide any minute! And I guess I'd better fire the charges now. You'll be too close! Get away from there, you kill yourself! The company isn't worth it! Eddie, oh, some fantastic work from David Graham here. He cut off! He cut off! Oh dear. Oh, there he goes. Big blammo on the mountain. Huge, soggy chunks of rock cascading all over the place. Again, more lovely stuff as we watch puppets from behind glass. From the perspective of being outside, just so much rain everywhere. Oh, and that's it. Here we go. It's iconic shot moment time. The explosions have taken the tractor to the edge of the cliff. And wouldn't you know it, it's now just teetering over the edge. Poor old Eddie is holding on for dear life. Again, it's, it's such a simple idea, but it's just so iconic. I think it's the idea and the the design of the vehicle, and you bring them both together, and it's just gorgeous. Eddie, the cutting's in no danger now. We can see from here. Bob, listen. The blast took my tractor right to the edge. <laughs> I can't get out. If I move to the door, the thing will overbalance. Okay, Damn. keep calm, Eddie. We're on our way. We've got an Italian job situation here. I've still got a case of Newtomic charges on board. Oh, you if Wally. goes over the edge, I'm going to be blown sky high. And probably take that lovely new road with you. Oh, dear. Well, on the bright side, you're so high up that if the tractor tips over the edge and you fall, you're just as likely to die from the fall rather than the explosion as well. National rescue. Come in, please. That's it. Let's get international rescue in here. Yeah, this is what I mean when I say you could almost cut out the first half entirely. Because really, the fact that they know Eddie is, is going to be important for how this plays out, but it's not crucial. This is international and Tintin's relationship with him almost goes completely by the wayside, except for the grandma subplot. International rescue, we need your help. <laughs> well, I didn't think you called just chat. Lots of familiar... Um, set elements around the uh, the interior of the tractor as well. I recognise the uh, winch control from Is It Trapped in the Sky? and one or two other various levers and control panels and such. I probably recognise them as much from later episodes as I do from previous episodes. It's probably this set would have been repurposed half a dozen times after this. Same with the, the tractor model, which is such a lovely model. Oh, Cheng's on the case. He's on the scene. That's all. You just stay uncomfortable. I thought you were going over that time. Yeah. So did I. 
actually, that's interesting. Chang and uh, Chang doesn't have his name in inverted commas. You still there? Lester just has JBL. That's not in inverted commas either. Don't worry. Everything's in hand. Mr. Gray's trying to contact International Rescue. So why does Eddie have his in there as if it's a nickname? I've never noticed that before. That's quite strange. You get the picture? Then you can't reach the tractor because of the state of the ground. Right. The explosions cut the ground up so bad, we just dare chance our weight on it. Mr. Gray's been making this call for a long time. I sometimes wonder if maybe John keeps people on the line for longer, just to have someone to talk to. You know, aside from the uh, the imminent disaster you're facing, anything else going on with your life? I hope I did right. Of course you did right, son. Here's the fun twist. What do you mean, anyway? I left the name of the guy who is going to be rescued to last. Why? Who is it? Eddie Houseman. Uh-oh. Eddie Houseman? Hey, Father, he knows us. Alan's grumpy face is back on. Eddie knows us. That means we can't help? Is that what you're saying, Dad? We let him fall to his death. That is what you're saying, Dad, isn't it? Isn't it, please? We're going to break our cover. Oh, no. And we all know how essential it is that this outfit remains secret. That's why we give everybody our names. Call down? No, John, we don't turn down any call. We've done everything we could to hide our identity, but not at the risk of wasting a life. Oh. Carry on, Scott. He's a good egg, is Jeff Tracy. Okay, Virgil, that's the brief. Use the magnetic grabs. Alan can help you on this one. Any questions? No, sir. No, sir. Away you go. Good luck. So, Thunderbirds 1 and 2 are away. This is an interesting shot because it's clearly played backwards. Please. International rest. A pan from Bob Gray and, and Chang and uh, Taylor up to the cab where Lester is making a call. Uh, it's obvious because, you know, the rain's going upwards. I can't reach him. Well, they're making things difficult. If they don't get here soon, they're gonna have a wasted trip. Chuck Taylor, yes. His job seems to be to state the obvious. Um, but speaking of stating things, I need to go back to something that I said earlier. Um, while Thunderbirds 1 and 2 were, were launching, it's always a good time for me to, well, stop talking because then it saves me like five minutes. You don't have to listen to me for as long. But I actually looked up uh, something that I mentioned earlier. And I, Glad Eddie can't. Even as I said it, I thought. I'm not entirely sure that's right. And I went and checked. And you know what? I was wrong. This was not a half-hour episode extended to a full hour. This was uh, like the second or third one that they produced as a full hour without having to create any additional material. Which, um... I mean, I hope I'm not the only one who feels this could have been one of the original half-hours. Even though it wasn't. Definitely wasn't. I'm going on the rescue. But I like this as well. Very sick. Grandma trying to, uh... Right, so. Make Tintin uh, a bit more sympathetic to Alan. Mr. Tracy let him go. Couldn't stop him. But yeah, I, 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 I don't know why this feels almost like an episode of Two Halves. Of course, I understand, Mrs. I would presume that, you know, despite the fact it wasn't made as a half-hour one, it may well have been written as a half-hour one, and possibly, you know, a lot of extra material was written for the first half. I don't know. It's one of those things where all that kind of stuff is is lost to time. We know that there were the first eleven were were you know padded out a bit. Thunderbird one. This is not one of those, but does contain similar bits of padding as we see in uh, in those eleven episodes. They're here. They're here. Hooray! Oh, oh yes, there it is. But you know, I, I have to apologise. I can only apologise because. Uh, you know, I don't, when I'm doing these, I don't sit here with like a pile of notes or anything. And uh, if I make, you know, if I get something wrong, then it's just bad memory. Uh, no rescue have arrived. I would dare anybody to uh, to do better, though. Just uh, an off-the-cuff, unrehearsed, unscripted, <laughs> impromptu episode commentary every week. Just, uh, you know, things like that slip through. So I apologise, and I shall correct myself where possible. It'll be a few more minutes before Thunderbird 2 gets here. Or I just won't mention it. Telling about those boulders. But here we go. We, it's not just uh, Thunderbird 1 turns up on the scene and then waits for Thunderbird 2. Barrier. It's rare that we actually see Thunderbird 1 have... Uh, we have. ...any capability of, of assisting in the rescue by itself. But they have this lovely... ...swoop and, and uh, dive on Thunderbird 1 here. It's Bob, Cheng and Chuck. Oh, watch enthralled oh big old boulder heading right for the explosives tractor but scott's prepared for that he's got some yellow needles she can fire and that's it sets up a barrier just above the tractor they look very thin and very flimsy but 
This is International Rescue Tech, remember, so of course they hold fast. Did you see what I saw? The machine. <laughs> Chuck, it's just, you know, I know he's saying it in, a, in admiration, but it's just, on paper, the dialogue is just, did you see what I saw? Uh, some machine. Now here's the situation, Virgil. I like these, all these guys, but Chuck is, um, as I said, he obviously, he, he often just states the obvious. FAB, Scott. Anyway, speaking of stating the obvious, here comes Thunderbird 2, with those special grabs. Should be a simple mission to come and pick up the tractor. And yet. Okay, Scott, I'm coming in now. I'll guide you in. I'll tell you where the tractor is. It's right here on the edge of this cliff. I don't think you could see it without my help, Virgil. Oh, that's a gorgeous shot of Thunderbird 2, though, as it approaches the tractor. Oh, fires its engines, and... It's wobbling time. Ooh. Hey, pull away, Virgil. Your vertical jets are tipping it over. Mm, vertical thrust now, Virgil. Put even more thrust your jets on top of the poor old tractor. Oh, that's not going to work. I like as well the panicked reactions from all the onlookers on the ground. What are we going to do, Scott? <laughs> that's, that's not something you want to hear from International Rescue when they come to save you. What are we going to do? But this is a great way of getting out of the problem. Grabs are attached. Scott, couldn't they fix a line that would hold it steady? No, Virgil, I'm sure that's not possible. As it's your idea, Virgil, I'm sure it's a bad one. Even a small increase in weight could tip that balance. Hey, wait. I've got an idea. And the classy music tells us this is going to be a good idea. Again, just visuals in this episode. This is a very nice looking episode. Come straight in and grab them. And if it doesn't work, if you've got a mop handy... Yeah, just the image of the tractor on the cliff is, is one gorgeous image, but then of Thunderbird 1 coming in to, to balance it. It's just... Oh, these are such gorgeous machines. And then, of course, you know, you mentioned gorgeous machines. Of course, Thunderbird 2 is here. I always feel that the, the huge grabs kind of look a bit... Well, firstly, I don't understand quite understand how they fit in the pod. I know they came out of there, but I don't quite understand how they fit in to begin with. And they're held on by these this tiny little connection. These massive great grabs. But somehow it all works. Seems to work. So. Okay, Virgil. Come in now. I'll take the strain. It's a very good idea, Scott. It's almost an idea you maybe should have had earlier. Yes. It's just so rare to see Thunderbird 1 actually doing anything beyond just arriving and landing, and Scott gets out and says, Right, Virgil, here's what I want you to do. Okay, Scott. We've got it. It's all yours. I've had two great ideas, and that's enough for me for one day. I'm going home. Oh, no, this is more gorgeous stuff. This, this image of Thunderbird 2 turning... And this is one of the prettier Thunderbird 2 models, as it was... I don't know how many models they went through over the course of the series, but you can tell by the size of the number 2 on the side that it was uh, re... you know, spruced up a bit several times, I think probably after the crash in terror in New York City. And there's a nice touch. The grand heroic music has suddenly shifted. They've got their frowning faces on. Because we're about to run into something that seems to be a common problem with Thunderbird 2. Its grabs, whether these huge claws or the magnetic ones, were basically useless almost every time. I think um, the Brink of Disaster is the only time the grabs actually work properly. Otherwise, we have to have this uh, tense, will they make it? And it is very tense as these um, you know, grabs... Each corner fails one by one. Hold her steady. Eddie's jumping for it. And this is something we discussed on the Fab Facts recently. Um, Eddie's jumping for it, but of course it's not the Eddie puppet that we're going to see land in the mud. Uh, it's going to be the Scott puppet. Scott is going to pull a bit of stunt work here. That's it. Get the tractor as close to the ground as they can. Let Eddie jump, and Scott can cover the fall for him. He's clear. Now get the tractor to level ground so we can get to the atomic charges. FAB, Scott. And I find it interesting that they, they doubled him there. I get that it was to prevent damaging the puppet um, in terms of, you know, the four... I don't know to what extent this was a, a plasticine sculpted face at this point. But it's... I find it odd that they would bother considering they put the puppet through hell throughout the rest of this episode anyway. When he was out drilling into the cliff face earlier, 
is covered in mud and water and now they're thinking, oh, we can't get that puppet muddy and wet. Don't want anything bad to happen to it. We can't hold her. Ooh. She's going. And that's it. Last one and kablamo. Now, it's it makes for a, a nice end to the episode. A big old explosion. But you got to think, you know, if that was a, a school bus full of kids or something, or uh, if the explosives truck was, say, over a dam with a village of, so, you know, 10,000 people below. Yeah, we wouldn't be getting the heroic music at that point. But because we were done with the tractor, it's okay to blow it to bits. Poor old tractor. You saved the road, Eddie. You saved the road. Did I? Oh, good old Eddie. Me International Rescue did all the saving around here. I'd love a model of that explosives truck, by the way. I mean, I really, really would love one. Look as though you're gonna get a chance. And this is clever as well. In order to avoid Eddie not identifying them, they just clear off. And, uh, you know, from the, the point of view of uh, Eddie and his chums, well, maybe International Rescue don't stop to, uh, to make sure everyone's okay. Well, how'd you like that? Oh, quite a bit. Off a rescue without even landing. And with Eddie not getting a sight of them, our secret is safe. <laughs> Jeff has uh, changed out of the shirt that he was in earlier. He's now wearing a comfortable blue cardigan. Sure, Tendon. Go right ahead. And this is just gorgeous shot of Thunderbird 1 and 2 together. I love this. It's the moody clouds. And just Thunderbird 2 in particular looks so beautiful and detailed. Yeah, I am now. Oh, good. This is a lovely way to end the episode. Shouldn't have taken a chance like that. <laughs> Gee... Tintin, genuinely concerned. Some nice side eye from Virgil towards Alan, who clearly is, you know, lapping up this uh, concern for his well-being and uh, accepting compliments about his bravery, as he might do. And we end on Grandma, Grandma's smiley face. She's so pleased with what she's done. And then back to that wonderful shot of Thunderbird Two. It, in my opinion, Thunderbird Two never looked better than in that shot right there. And there we go. That was. End of the road, and I said at the beginning this is a, a, a darn good episode, and I stand by that. It's not one of the absolute greats, but it's just bubbling under. The There are so many uh, standout visuals throughout this one. This is a very nice-looking episode, and also the music just does so much. They they all come together to create a wonderful sense of, of atmosphere, and also a bit of building tension and such as well. But there are quite a few... Um, sort of dull spots through this where you know the visuals are all that we've got there isn't too much happening on the sort of character front which is a shame because when this episode does character stuff it does it really well um particularly that bubbling sort of subplot with grandma and alan and tintin i don't so much believe um the tintin eddie relationship for a moment um because it's like you know they share one scene together what they have four lines tops so I don't really believe Eddie is an old flame as such, but it's just a nice setup to, you know, you can use that as a springboard to develop the Alan and Tintin thing further with uh, a bit of bonus grandma thrown in. So there we go. Not a, not a classic episode of Thunderbirds, but, you know, pretty good stuff um, all round. Everybody involved with this. Jolly good work. Yeah, jolly good work, everybody. <laughs> Ooh, what? a Thunderbirds episode. You would say yeah. you wanted something iconic. End of the road is pretty true. iconic. True, yeah. Yeah, you're right. So there right. you go. But, yeah, and, nice. and very uh, appropriate for Thunderbirds Danger Zone, the card game as well, because that's ah, one of the missions in there, isn't it? It is, yes. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, will you be selling that at the uh, London Film and Comic Con? London Comic Con, yes. And if the table's yeah. a bit quiet, we can have a game. Well, well actually, oh, fun. we yeah. could have a game anyway, even if it's of not course. quiet. Just people, you know, we'll welcome Absolutely. some people into play. That would be right. fun, wouldn't it? great idea let's okay do. let's aim to do that depending on how busy things are yeah anyway that i think is the end of this one isn't it what an episode we've done all the stuff all the we fab have. facts all the randomizer yeah everything we said we'd do we messed up really? the secondary fab fact obviously yeah, yeah we've got to mess something I mean, that up was, yeah uh, that was going to be so brilliant and that, that was all my fault you blew it oh dear Anyway, it went up like it was had 10,000 tons of TNT in it. Uh, so very Jerry Anderson. <laughs> yeah, nice work. That's right. Uh, no, yeah. please, well, what do you want? Pos 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 Do you know, Richard, I did look at a terrible stat uh, yesterday. Oh. 
Only twenty-one oh percent of people who listen to the Jerry Anderson podcast every week yeah. Yeah. have yeah. subscribed to it. What? I don't understand. Why would you do? Why would you not subscribe? Because then you've got to search for it when you want to yeah. listen to it, rather than just yeah. being prompted or say, "Here's a new episode." So that's right. If you are listening, it really helps other people find us, and it helps us. Uh, if you will just pop along and press the plus or the subscribe or the follow button on whatever you're listening to, uh, then. You don't have to go searching for us. We'll just be in your podcast yeah. inbox or whatever the equivalent yeah. thing is every Whether week. Whether you like it or not. And it also helps people find us too and then increase the uh, the number of podstrons in the world, which can only be a good thing because you're all wonderful. I mean, I think we should give something special to our, our subscribers. I don't know what. Yes, don't know what it it's, be. it's actually a bit tricky to uh, to work to out actually who's specify who's data, data protection. Uh, I, just get a, I just get a percentage. Anyway, oh, I see. Look, I let's see. move on. Yeah. Subscribing well, what about, and subs- what about if you're a subscriber, why not make yourself a little badge? I'm a subscriber to the Jerry Addis podcast and put it on your coat or jumper, wear it to work or school, wear it or, to London yeah. Comic Con. <laughs> yes, and then we'll have a game of Thunderbird's Danger Zone with you. Okay, I'll this is getting what, too no, no, hang complicated. On, hang on, no, Jamie, Jamie, oh, if dear yes, listener, yes. if you are a subscriber to the Jerry Anderson podcast yes. and you fashion yourself a little badge saying, I'm a subscriber to the Jerry Anderson podcast and you wear it to London Film and Comic Con when I happen to be there, details soon to be announced, I will give you a signed copy of the audio version of Five Star Five as read by the wonderful Robbie Stevens. Now, you, you're saying that to the first person who does that That'll or to anyone who person. does that? No, 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 that's going to be the first person. Okay, I just wanted to caveat that slightly. Thanks. I was thinking, where's he going to get this stock of Five Star Five from? <laughs> anyway, uh, yes, no. that's that's a lovely idea. We'd love to see that. Or even even a T-shirt if you're feeling very um, Oof, special. Well, yeah. Okay, anyway, let's, we're, we're getting uh, too niche yes. here. Yes, sorry. Uh, sorry. Email us, podcast.jerryanderson.com with any questions or yep. thoughts. Please write us a review, do us a revating, those lovely yeah. things, and please make sure you're subscribed. And we'll be back in your clammy ears with our horrible sticky fingers. Uh, <laughs> I really wish you wouldn't. <laughs> next next hey, week. That. Sorry. Okay, goodbye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> oh. Stage one complete. Let's go. They're not, That's terrible. They're not actually too sticky. No, that um, is terrible. I don't even want you to even to be a bit sticky. Just don't <laughs> mention it. Uh, <laughs> How is that going to, uh, you know, inspire no, people to listen? I've no idea. I don't know. It just it just makes us feel more relatable because everybody's had that problem where they pick something up and got, a, you know, a sticky what about that, And a sort of a, a clammy upper, upper lip as well. Do you get that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A bit Maybe of we should talk, yeah. That's right. A bit of beading on the upper lip. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's always attractive, isn't oh, it? Oh, dear. <sighs> yes. <clears throat> Uh, anyway, what, it's just as well no one listens to this bit, isn't it? Oh, thank goodness. It'd be so embarrassing oh, if anybody imagine. ever heard any of these end bits. Yeah, we're not, we're not actually still recording, are we? No, I don't think so. Oh, anyway. oh hang on. There's a, oh, I think I am. Yeah. Well, let's quick. Let's press stop before this right. gets any yeah, weirder. I think we ought to. <clears throat> uh, bye. Pressing stop. Bye. You have been listening to the Jerry Anderson Podcast. Wasn't it fun? You have been listening to an Anderson Entertainment production.